Welcome to Ethics Day. We have a full day today. Um, I will start uh, with great pride. Every year we give a prize for uh, the winner of the Pediatric Ethics at School contest. And this was, this time, uh, very appropriate with my adolescent medicine practice. Uh, we have a senior that's soon going to go to college who actually won the contest with her essay on shadowing. And it's with uh, great pride that we give this to Sage Petty, who gets her certificate. Next, a few words uh, remembering uh, Dr. Liking. This is the Liking Memorial Lecture, which is funded uh, by the Liking family that has been committed to Children's National for his entire career. He was a resident here. He did his, uh, uh, he was in charge of many things, including pathology and uh, settled uh, in hematology, becoming one of the leaders in pediatric hematology. And in the course of his work in pediatric hematology, which is what we met, uh, we both went to the Kennedy Center for Bioethics to do some studies, and he specialized in the issue of um, pediatric ascent. And, and was very influential in pediatric ethics. So that's the reason why we named this conference for pediatric ethics. Okay. Let's see. I guess uh, I will be giving the lecture on suffering, and you'll be introducing me. <laughs> 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 Good morning. I'm Vanessa Madrigal. I'm one of our pediatric critical care doctors and the director of the ethics program. And it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Tomas Silver and his family of panelists today, mm -hmm. Dr. Silver, Dr. Silver, and Dr. Silver. And I'll go <laughs> a little bit more into detail about that in a minute. But today is really a celebration. It's a celebration of Dr. Silver being here at Children's National 50 years. 50 years. Imagine how many minds he has taught and hearts he has touched. 50 years of trainees, colleagues, staff, and more. His journey started graduating from the Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina. He did his first pediatric residency there at the Hospital, uh, Hospital de Niños in Buenos Aires. And then he came to the United States and did his second pediatric residency at Thomas Jefferson University in the community pediatrics track, and then later his fellowship in adolescent medicine here at Children's National, and a master's in special studies in bioethics at George Washington University. Uh, he, he then, during these last four decades, has dedicated himself to the Adolescent Medicine Fellowship, um, teaching dozens of leaders, precepting more than a 1,000 students and residents. He has spent over three decades leading the pediatric ethics program here, the ethics consult service, chair of the clinical ethics committee. He is an ethicist for the IRB, a research ethicist for the CTSI, and research subject advocate. In the field of ethics, he has edited a book in 1983, one of the first books in pediatric ethics. A guest edited several issues for the ethics of the pediatric panel. He has twice been chair of the section of bioethics for the American Academy of Pediatrics and has led the um, authored, uh, uh, authored lead seven books, um, including an ethics anthology, an adolescent medicine textbook in English, two in Spanish, 52 book chapters, 125 peer review articles, 144 educational articles. He's won multiple awards. He is the editor in chief of the Pediatric Ethoscope which is a journal dedicated to ethics in pediatrics, one of very few in the country. And we are honored 
and privileged to have him be our colleague and speaker today for the lecture. Uh, now to move uh, briefly to our panelists. Um, I'll start on the end. Dr. Addy Silver holds a BA from Duke and his PhD in psychology from George Washington University. He's a crisis intervention specialist, emergency services, and mobile crisis units in Fairfax Falls Church Community Service Board. Dr. Irina Carlota Silver holds a BA from George Washington University and a PhD in anthropology from New York University. She's a tenured associate professor at City University of New York, where she is chair of the Department of Anthropology. Dr. Daniel Silver, who will be speaking with us again later today, holds a BA from the George Washington University and a PhD in philosophy from Vanderbilt University, currently vice president for academic affairs and professor of philosophy at Piedmont College in, um, in, in Georgia. Can you imagine the discussions at the dinner table with the family growing up? I had a brief uh, window of opportunity in the name that uh, but, uh, Thank you very much, and we are excited to hear what you're today. In the course of our ethics consults, they're always very difficult. This never had, we never had an easy ethics conversation. And uh, one of the things that uh, always comes across is the amount of suffering involved. So I, I gave a bit of thought of this in my final academic presentation. And uh, I just want to say we have nothing to disclose. Uh, Dr. Silver, Dr. Silver, and Dr. Silver are Dr. Silver's children. <laughs> Hence, their commentaries may be lenient or mellow, but if past this prologue, this will be highly unlikely. <laughs> okay. When I first came to Children's in 1969, 50 years ago, I fell in love with this place. As a matter of fact, Rosita, my wife, <laughs> um, still thinks about children as the other woman. <laughs> so, uh, the year 2019 is a special year as it will see the last tour of Elton Jones, of Paul Simon, of John Baez, and so this will be the Silver Swan song. <laughs> And it's dedicated to my wife, Rosita Silver, my best friend, and for six years, my love. <laughs> Let me begin by saying how much I enjoyed the opportunity of working with the hospital leadership through the three decades that I led the pediatric cancer program. That was very nice and supportive. And if you I don't have an arrow, but let's say Dr. Lichen is there. Uh, the one to the third one from the left is Sandy Lichen. And uh, you may recognize there also Dr. Bacho, <laughs> some time ago, and uh, Dr. Arnold Eichmann and others of, of the leaders in the hospital. There's a deep appreciation that I have for Larry D'Angelo, who has supported my ethics work. This is my family of origin. Larry can't be here. He is celebrating his 50 years of graduation from Harvard. Uh, and at this point, is doing so with his roommate, Chris Wallace, and his friend, um, uh, Al Gore. Uh, <laughs> They were all together, and, and he said his very best. And Lisa Tuckman, who has very dynamically taken over uh, the leadership in adolescent medicine. And I want to share my delight at having Dr. Vanessa Madrigal introduced me to be my successor as the new director of the Pediatric Ethics Program and for inviting me to be with it. Now, the 
purpose of this lecture is to provide a narrative approach on how we can incorporate suffering into our professional and personal lives. Uh, the content will be a roller coaster of stories about the impact of suffering on patients and clinicians, the nature of suffering and the goals of medicine, a little visit to Greek mythology and mirror neurons and the empathic response, so fasten your seatbelt. Uh, suffering and the meaning of the word patient. The word derives from the Latin patiens, which in turn derives from the word patior, which actually means I am suffering. So why are we clinicians so often uneasy when dealing with facing human suffering, especially the suffering of children? You see there the cover of our upcoming issue of Pediatric Ethoscope, and this is United States of America, southern border, children separated from their migrant parents seeking asylum. So the explanation could be that in our era of impressive scientific discoveries, the topic is so profoundly subjective and so difficult to teach. So I'll begin with a true story. The year was 1966. It was the first time I was on call as a pediatric intern. Maria was in status asthmaticus, and I became her doctor. That's in the inpatient unit, of course. Maria got progressively worse. Her face expressed vividly the anxiety of her hunger for air and her despair. She had nasal flaring, intercostal retractions, mouth wheezing, and was gasping for air. All day long, her family was surrounding her hospital bed, and she was not responding to treatment. The family left in the evening, and her physician <coughs> uncle stayed next to her all night long. The course of illness. Maria had me worried. Through the night, I increased her nebulizations and started her on an aminophilin drip, a 20th century treatment for a status asthmaticus. Gradually, her respiratory rate began to decline, the loud wheezing disappeared, her anxiety gave way to deep sleep, her pallor turned into rosy cheeks, and before morning rounds, her physician uncle gave me the thumbs up sign. Of concern, however, she was much more tachycardic, and she had become hypertensive. Morning rounds with the attending. Well, Maria is in CO2 narcosis. Uh, we cannot wake her up. She's in respiratory failure. She's intubated, but nevertheless, she dies that morning. Boy, that was hard. I was devastated. I could not stop thinking about this poor child, her despairing family, and the torturing thought that if I had recognized CO2 narcosis, I could have saved her. I thought a thousand times about what I could have done to save Maria, and I concluded that this would never happen again. I would give up medicine. That's it. I'll leave the profession. Returning home, 24 hours later, I couldn't help but see that I was returning home and Maria never would. I broke down in tears and told my wife that I was going to leave the residency and give up being a doctor. She helped me through this crisis and reminded me to think about the time I had told her why I actually wanted to become a doctor in the first place. So this is the year 1950. I was seven years old. My mother had metastatic breast cancer and had been hospitalized following a seizure. The next day, my father and I set out to visit her. It was a beautiful day in June. With my father, we had bought beautiful flowers, her favorite ones for her. When we arrived, 
the bed was empty. Uh, we inquired whether she was taken away for some test, only to be told by a clerk that she had died during the night and had been taken to the morgue. Although I was only seven years old, I knew that what had happened was wrong. And that's when I decided to become a doctor. Then, in 1966, I returned to my patients the following day and was received with compassion by my attending physician and my colleagues. But Maria stayed in my memory forever. Now, these kind of stories speak to us, and we have to answer. So they call me to explore with you the nature of suffering and the goals of medicine, the experience of the wounded healer, the need to reject the 20th century model of detached concern and replace it with an affective model of empathy. Suffering is experienced by persons, not solely by bodies. The source of suffering is the threat threat to the intactness of the person as a complex social and psychological entity. A clinician's failure to understand the nature of suffering can result actually in interventions that may be scientifically adequate, but not only fail to remove suffering, but can become the source of suffering themselves. So talking about uh, nature of suffering and the goals of medicine, we have a twin obligation to medically treat, yes, but also to relieve suffering. And that is how we become able to heal. Healing, I propose, requires an attunement to suffering. This is the experience of the wounded healer. So at a time when modern medicine is moving towards ever-increasing specialization, it may seem quaint to search in mythology for the roots and origins of healing. But we'll do that. Asclepius is the son of Adonis and Coronis. Coronis, while pregnant with Asclepius, that pregnancy had resulted from an affair. Adonis, her husband, finds out about the affair and is so enraged that he kills her. These gods were tough. Adonis then saves his son by doing a C-section and entrusts his son to Chiron, the centaur. Chiron is versed in the art of healing. He's an unusual character. He's a Greek god who dwells in a cave and suffers from an incurable wound. He helps everybody, but his wound is incurable. And he's the mythological physician, our ancestor, our precursor. He had a strange power, a primordial source of knowledge, the presence of a wound in which the healer forever partakes. The notion of the wounded healer is the idea that all of us contribute to help other people and ourselves by virtue of our wounds. It is by virtue of our own wounds that we have compassion and empathy for the suffering of others. So a little bit about the story of empathy in medical care. Patients seek empathy from their physicians. Before medicine became more scientific, empathy was mostly all a good doctor could offer. In our time, with a gigantic increase in medical knowledge and the reduction of the time physicians spend with their patients, a tension began to develop between the physicians striving for scientific detachment and the, quotes old-fashioned care for patients their personal feelings. The medical encounter facing the computer rather than the patient is emblematic of this distancing. Yet, the perception that empathy 
is important has never faded. The 20th century understanding of empathy, however, was that it should consist of correctly acknowledging the emotional state of another without experiencing the state oneself. In my medical training, the message was that we need to aim for detached concern, an ability to listen empathetically without becoming emotionally involved. This was compared to the need to maintain the same detachment in clinical encounters. Ooh, as I do here. Let's see. Um, we have to approve? Decline. Decline. Oh, no. Oh, thank you. Uh, to maintain the same detachment in clinical encounters that what enables medical students, for instance, to dissect the cadaver. Note how this contrasts with the lay meaning of empathy. For everybody else outside the field of medicine, empathy is clearly an essentially effective mode understand. Okay. I'm suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Can, is the question, should clinicians experience the suffering of each patient? The statement that clinicians should not experience the state oneself emphasizes empathy as an intellectual rather than emotional form of knowing. This makes the assumption that experiencing emotion is not that important for understanding of what the patients are experiencing. The problem of merely labeling emotion is that the test concern postulates that knowing how a person feels is sufficient. It's not. The reality, however, is that the function of empathy is to recognize what it feels like to experience something. So empathy is a work of attunement. Uh, Judy Halpern, one of my heroes, in her seminal work on empathy, proposes that clinicians should harness their emotional responses to enhance the medical care of their patients. And she uh, entitled her classic on this subject, From Detached Concern to Empathy, Humanizing Medical Practice. Wonderful book. Um, the clinician's emotional response, I sustain, is to be welcomed. Emotions help guide and hold our attention on what is humanly significant. Empathy can facilitate trust and disclosure and be directly therapeutic. The empathic response to suffering makes being a physician more meaningful and more satisfying. Um, there is this big concern, which I can't understand, with burnout. And the answer to burnout is to enjoy what one does. And the acquiring of the empathic reply to issues uh, is, is very satisfying. I will illustrate this with another story, a moment of empathy. This time the year was 1977. We were all happy and proud of our new children's hospital. I can tell you stories about the old one, but let's continue with this one. And this is a story about John's death. John had been my patient since he was 12 years old. Just short of his 18th birthday, this dynamic, bright, athletic, and handsome young man was executed by a bullet to the head. That same week, his distraught mother, 
I brought in his younger sister to see me because the girl was having panic attacks. At that visit, we also talked about her son, of whom she had been very proud. And at one moment, she said to me, with a sad smile, you know, Dr. Silver, he had all his immunizations up to date. At that moment, I became overwhelmed. And with tears in my eyes at the broken voice, I responded, yes, you have always been a wonderful mother. And then we hugged. After that exchange, the grieving sister trusted me with her care for her entire adolescence. It's okay for a doctor to experience the feelings of his patients. Yes, as a matter of fact, this has a neurological basis. There is a biological basis for the human processing of another's suffering. It is hardwired in our species and eventually makes possible the alleviation of suffering. Neuroscience has identified mirror neurons in inferior frontal and posterior parietal regions. They are active both when one is performing a task and when one is watching another person performing that task. The neurological basis for this human capacity for empathy has been appropriately named the mirror neuron system. This capacity extends to communications. For example, functional magnetic resonance imaging scans show that when two people share an experience, the same regions of the brain get activated simultaneously in the teller and in the listener. So in everyday life, the mirror system is at work when we are greeted by a friendly smile or when an outburst of yawning erupts during the presentation. Hopefully not this one. <laughs> and this hardwired for the capture of other people's emotions and their suffering is so powerful because it has proven essential to the survival of the species. That's what we have. And this system starts very early in the lifespan. This is my favorite picture of all pictures. Uh, psychological observation of young children have identified infants attempting to comfort a crying baby. And you can see how this little, little young girl is able to calm down uh, this crying baby. And of course, in mature adults, in, in most mature adults, uh, this system is fully developed. Now, they have studied the mirror neurons in physicians and their patients. Helen Rees did that. She utilized advanced image technology to study diets of physicians and their patients. Reese discovered detectable physiologic changes. The very regions of the brain that were activated in suffering patients were active, albeit less intensely, in the physicians that took care of them. So the accurate experiencing of another person's brain by being milder is probably what may enable clinicians to understand a person's suffering without being overwhelmed by it but not being detached from it. This human quality is what underlies our capacity for empathy. So empathy is the delicate balance and act of joining patient suffering and not allowed to be swept away by it. But you have to join it. The alternative to becoming insensitive or even callous towards patient suffering is developing empathic imagination can be done nicely through a praxis of narrative medicine. Uh, this is congruent with our everyday experience. We understand a friend's distress about an impending divorce. We celebrate the promotion of a colleague, and we feel a child's disappointment after losing a soccer game. That's what we do in life. The same type of empathy that is the glue that holds families together and is essential to social relationship needs to be systematically incorporated 
into the very core of healthcare. It takes two to tango. I offer an idea connecting to my birthplace. Empathic care can be compared to dancing the tango in that one needs to pay attention to his or her partner, but needs to do it selectively. Uh, there's a synchronicity. The tango dancer that pays attention to each partner's step will eventually lose a step or become exhausted. The analysis stresses that if clinicians identify completely with the suffering of every patient, they would eventually burn out. Similar to tango dancing, the key to communicating empathy is to remain in synchrony with each patient. So some final thoughts. It is necessary, but not sufficient for professionals to become proficient in delivering empathic care. There's also the need for institutional support for this type of practice. Um, Thomas Lee has developed his theme uh, in a grand round here at Children's Hospital some time ago in his marvelous book, An Epidemic of Empathy in Healthcare. So we all need to work at the creation of a culture that facilitates and generalizes such implementation. The Pediatric Ethics Program at Children's will continue its contribution to fulfill its goal. Uh, I have some acknowledgments to do. Uh, first of all, the medical team, for all the work you do, thank you. And for the ethics consult you have entrusted to the ethics team, thank you. A special thank you to all the members of the Clinical Ethics Committee who are joining us today for Ethics Day and so generously give of their time. Could you please stand up? I have uh, also the pleasure to announce that at 9.30, Professor Dan Silver, his conference will be on philosophies on suffering here in the auditorium. At 11, I'll be doing psychiatric grand rounds on adolescent brain development and decisional capacity. And at noon, we'll have a celebration. And now, Commentary by the panel. Okay, so, uh, as always, a very tough act to follow. Um, and as the youngest of the four people up here, I've got pretty used to having to follow some pretty large footsteps. So, I invite you all to please empathize. <laughs> um, so just from a psychological perspective, suffering and empathy, I've got a few slides that commentary on what my dad presented. Um, so this idea of empathy was first coined by the British psychologist Edward Kitchener over 100 years ago, combining these two Greek words, em and pathos. And the idea really comes from a translation from the German word, einfalach, meaning feeling into. Um, and this term wasn't originally designed to describe psychological or the medical field, but it came from philosophical aesthetics. And the idea was that, you know, we have extrapolated this, uh, this concept to first psychology and then later to medicine. And so essentially the idea is that the same way that someone could feel into a Mozart symphony or a Rodin sculpture or a short story by Borges, that you could also feel into uh, of patients, suicidal, adolescence despair, or the grief of parents uh, possibly losing their own child. And so then comes this question, is empathy emotional labor? Um, and Larson and Yao of the Group Health Cooperative would say yes. Um, they would tell us that, uh, at, you see the definition here, um, psychological process that encompasses a collection of affective, cognitive, behavioral mechanisms that happens in reaction to the observed experience of the mother. So what does that really mean? Well, basically that it's really hard work. It involves our emotions, our thoughts, and our actions in direct response to observing another person's emotional experience, their pain, their 
your suffering. And so how can we get to this point? Um, and again, uh, we can make an analogy to the arts, um, and in this case, the theater. So looking at clinicians as actors. And so Larson and Yao talk about two different types of emotional labor in terms of comparison to acting. So you have the surface, surface acting, and these are the typical communication skills that we've all been trained in, the act of listening, making the eye contact, not interrupting, summarizing statements, responding to the person's affect. Um, but they would say that empathy, the hard part, is really that deep acting that you want to get to. So drawing upon your own experiences to understand the emotions of that other person. Um, and the idea here is that deep acting is going to bring greater rewards because it's generating sort of this feedback of empathy. And so the idea would then be that professionals can generate this virtuous cycle of empathy and we're going to feel more, more likely nourished and refreshed by our work as opposed to being stopped by it. You know, my dad's trying to do the idea of avoiding burnout. Um, and so some might say, well, you know, isn't that kind of cynical to compare healthcare professionals to actors. Um, and Larson and Yao would say it's quite the opposite because acting is not synonymous with pretending. Um, actors are on stage sometimes once, twice a day, several weeks at a time, and yet they don't get tired of what they're doing. And so why is that? Um, and why can they kind of repeat their performances over and over with so much gusto? And the idea is that you know, they're really invested in responding to the feedback of the other actors in the drama. Um, and so, again, I said I would make it a brief commentary. In conclusion, what we would really like to do is just invite all clinicians to enact this idea uh, to the best of our abilities when we're entering our patients' rooms, when we're seeing patients in our offices, and really whenever we're responding to another person's suffering. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will pass on to my sister for the end of the Give me one moment. Hi, I'm Lottie. Um, let's see, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, I used Mac. Can you what do I do? Right, from the beginning. Okay, great. I have a clicker. Oh, this. Okay. Hi, I'm Lottie Silver. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and provide some commentary um, on my father's talk. As you've heard, a culmination of his decades of work, of care, and analysis of the practice of adolescent medicine. Uh, I am a sociocultural anthropologist and have spent the better part of the last 25 years engaged in the study of post-war society. Specifically, I've examined the legacies of El Salvador's civil war, uh, 1980 to 1992, by exploring how men, women, teens, and young children rebuild their lives in the aftermath of extraordinary and everyday violence. Through this work, I have learned about the importance of empathic listening and the aim of positioned research for social justice. You may ask what an anthropology of war, of violence, or a study of insurgency contributes to our conversation here today. In part, it is my finding. The Salvadorans I worked with shared their experiences of extreme loss and pain with me but most often frames their language of suffering through a critique and anger aimed at the structural forces that kept them from living, as they said in Spanish, una vida digna, a dignified life. So while we are thinking about suffering and the role of healer and healing, I would offer that we can also reframe the question and ask about possibility, about what it takes to make a dignified life and who defines it as such. Anthropology is helpful here, particularly its method of ethnography, which offers a textured and intimate analysis of everyday life and how people make sense of their world. Anthropologists pursue qualitative research based on in-depth fieldwork that involves participant observation. Anthropologists pay careful attention to research ethics, 
and how we portray the people uh, and topics we explore. I believe that these questions of representation can impact the kind of work that you all do. The kind of anthropology that most animates my work is public or engaged anthropology because it addresses public problems in public ways. Issues like war, like global health disparities, um, and are, can be an activist and transformative stance. This is anthropology rooted in a politics of accountability and practices engaged listening and witnessing. But I want us to question the politics and narratives of suffering. What violence does this reproduce as people are asked to tell their story again and again? The woman survivor of war and suffering mother who tells her story repeatedly to different outlets, from Save the Children to Amnesty International to a Dutch NGO. There are direct implications for practitioners here. How many times and in what context do kids and their kin have to tell their clinical stories? What does this leave out? I come to this critique not only from my work in El Salvador and with the diaspora, but also from my own unexpected entrance many years ago now into what some might term the pediatric rare disease community. To make sense of my embodied experiences of pain and fear, of anxiety and uncertainty, and of injustice, and in the name of my child's personhood and dignity, note, I have never framed it as suffering, I turn to the work of medical anthropology. Why? Because of its cogent analysis and critique of biomedicine, of social authority, of the cultural construction of disease, disease, and the ways institutional practices have often unintended consequences, and most significantly, how science is indeed not culture-free. Science is cultural, medicine is cultural. Here, too, what I have learned juxtaposes assumptions around suffering with that hard-won fight to ensure a dignified life, one that defies quality of life indicators and rights against childhood as an arc of becoming. Clearly, the field of medical anthropology is diverse, and there are some ground groundbreaking models to build from. You all are probably familiar with Arthur Kleinman's classic, The Illness Narrative, which redefined the field as it distinguished between the categories of illness and disease. For Kleinman, illness refers to how the sick person and members of the family or wider social network perceive, live with, and respond to symptoms and disability. This is the lived experiencing of monitoring bodily processes, which is always culturally shaped. In contrast, disease is what the practitioner creates in the recasting of illness in terms of theories of disorder. This category is also cultural, but, uh, but shaped by the practice, logic, and project of medicine. Significantly, Kleinman tells us that in this process of recasting, something tremendous is lost and that is lived experience. From here, Kleinman has been a leader in developing the concept of social suffering, which he defines as involving a series of components that move beyond the body. Ultimately, for him, he can't separate out the medical, the economic, and the political. And so generations of medical anthropologists have pursued cross-cultural work that moves from subjectivity to structural violence, that addresses institutionalized racism and the technocratic fit. Oh. Okay. So to conclude, I would urge us all to consider the important work that historicizes the very category of childhood and to keep in mind that kids and teens are the makers of history and society. Medical anthropology, cultural anthropology, the anthropology of childhood, can provide us with ways to unpack what we mean by suffering through an attention to a lived experience in the everyday, across context, and within larger systems of power. Something that I believe my father has done through his practice of the healing arts, his life's work. This pushes us to question our normative and naturalized assumptions about which bodies suffer, how, and for whom. And if we are going to talk about suffering, I suggest that we must read it against that search for a dignified life, again, something that has rooted the art of my father's clinic, cynical, and teaching career.
the um, Yeah, I actually don't have a PowerPoint presentation for right now because I will be uh, speaking uh, at 9.30, as my dad mentioned, and so I will reserve the bulk of my remarks for, uh, for that occasion. Uh, but I did just want to make a few brief comments, and I know we don't have much time. Um, and I, I can sometimes get carried away, but I promise I'll be very brief. Uh, so I'm supposed to give a philosophical uh, perspective. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, I think everybody's been doing philosophy here. You know, I see philosophy, uh, I, I, I guess I follow uh, Wilfred Sellers, a very prominent American philosopher, who said, you know, philosophy is just the attempt to figure out in the broadest possible sense of that term how things uh, hang together in the broadest possible sense of that term. So it's very broad, very abstract, and then I see it as sort of connecting and intersecting with everything that's been discussed here. Uh, and I have to say I'm very proud to be standing shoulder to shoulder with my father and my two fellow doctors here. Uh, talking about a topic that, well, unfortunately, it's not a happy topic, but it's, it's a super important topic. Uh, what I'm, I'll just say a few words about what I will think I, what I think I will do in my um, presentation here at 9:30. Uh, that'll that'll tie into some of the remarks that have been made already. Uh, one thing that I think it's important to do as a philosopher is to um, work on the clarification of just the concept of suffering. I think my my brother and sister have both, um, especially my sister in her kind of critical remarks have suggested ways in which the concept of suffering uh, can sometimes uh, promote a certain ideology or a certain politics, a uh, certain, uh, certain uh, conception of normativity that could be criticized, that could be uh, problematic, could even be oppressive. Um, so uh, it kind of in the spirit, I would say, of uh, trying to figure out what, what is this be that dignified life uh, that my sister was just talking about. I do think it's important to conceptualize suffering and to and to think of it in terms uh, that I think my father alluded to in his remarks, uh, that suffering constitutes a kind of threat to the person. I think you were appealing to uh, the notion of Eric uh, Cassell in, in his, um, uh, I think, early 1980s uh, classic article, which he talks about suffering as a, a threat to the person, as, as an existential sort of threat, uh, and, um, and that it involves much more than physical or even psychological pain, uh, pain and suffering being somewhat distinct but related notions. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is get, get this, get, is try to suggest a sense of what suffering that can be conceptualized as being in following Castle uh, in this sense, but then also uh, asking what is it to be a person? Uh, what is a person? I mean, if, this is, if suffering is conceived as an existential uh, crisis confronting the person, then what is the person? Uh, does it make sense to think about the good or a plurality of goods for a uh, person? Um, and if suffering is an existential threat to that person and the goods that they might pursue, um, then what are we to say of it? Is suffering simply just a bad thing that is to be rejected out of court as something lacking completely in any value whatsoever? Uh, is there any sense in which suffering could be said to have a meaning itself, a meaning or a value in its own right? I'll talk a bit about philosophical traditions and religious traditions that say yes, in fact, uh, there is a value in suffering. And then also the question, what is, what is the response to suffering? Certainly within the community of healers, healthcare professionals, uh, and as I think you said in your initial uh, very heartfelt response to your mother's passing, uh, one response is to say, no, this is wrong, and I'm going to fight it with every fiber of my being and, put, and, and do the best I can to put an end to it, although one knows one will never finally succeed. But that is a kind of existential response to the existential crisis. But there are others. Uh, there are other responses that, that I'd like us to uh, explore. Uh, the, uh, the one thing that I'll mention that I think is a, a favorable, what, what I'll recommend is a favorable response, uh, really ties in, and I know you like this, uh, this thinker, really ties into the thought of Victor Frank, uh, a neurologist and psychiatrist uh, who was a survivor of the Auschwitz death camp uh, during the Holocaust uh, and who was the author of a, a bestseller of uh, Man's Search for Meaning that came out in the late 1950s. And he says there that really the main, uh, really the way to think of what it is that persons seek uh, in their life, uh, that's sort of the main motivational force for human beings uh, that inspires them to do whatever it is that they uh, do in their lives, is really the quest for meaning, uh, the quest to make sense of their lives, either in terms of something transcendent or in terms of kind of an overarching story that they might tell themselves about what their life means. And I, I would suggest that that is a, an important um, place to look, uh, the quest for meaning and the extent to which we might participate in facilitating other people's 
quest for meaning. That's an important concept to bear in mind, an important place to look in terms of thinking about uh, a, um, uh, a rounded uh, existential response to the challenge of, um, of suffering. And I think it actually connects, Adi, I didn't mention too much about what you said, but I think it connects also to your comments about acting. Uh, because, uh, yeah, acting is not pretending. If you think about it, I mean, just acting, we, when, we, when we do anything, we're acting, right? I mean, so there's a sense in which there's, there's no way in which we can escape if we live the lives of human beings acting in some sense. The sort of deep acting that you're talking about reminds me of the method acting that was really such a prominent approach to acting uh, some decades ago, certainly survived, in which a person who's acting uh, really channels, embodies uh, another person. I mean, they are that connected to that other person in their own empathetic imagination, uh, except that very often that other person is fictional. It doesn't, doesn't actually exist, interestingly enough. So our capacities for empathetic imagination, not only do they allow us to reach out and, and connect with other people who are real, live, existing human beings, but they, it opens up an entire realm of, uh, as you might say, possible worlds, uh, not existing, but possible realities, uh, with which we can also uh, engage in that type of uh, sympathetic, empathetic by imagination. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's by way of just some ideas, throwing them out there. I'll elaborate more on them. Uh, I see that we're close to 9 o'clock, so I think I'll stop there and thank all of you for your contribution.